when you have open source, you know, Bitcoin base layer, Lightning, whatever other layers could exist, any entity that starts interfacing with those um, systems now starts interfacing with every other kind of environments, ecos- money ecosystem in the world that is also tied into that system. And so, for example, Cash App uh, is, you know, it's got a very large you know, set of users. And by incorporating into the Bitcoin and Lightning Network, they start connecting to, you know, other ecosystems around the world without even necessarily knowing it. Uh, now, there still can be frictions on that in terms of like KYC, AML, and, and kind of these artificial restrictions that start going on top of that. Um, but the point is, I think that basically having this, these open source layers that can, that can connect different monetary ecosystems together and, and bypass their artificial kind of firewalls. Robert Kiyosaki. The author of the personal finance book Rich Dad Poor Dad has once again expressed his endorsement of assets such as Bitcoin, gold, and silver in response to the escalating threat of inflation affecting global living standards. Gold recently surpassed the $2,000 per ounce mark, signaling a consistent recovery amid the depreciation of fiat currencies. As a staunch advocate for the Bitcoin ecosystem, Kiyosaki advised his over 2.4 million followers on Twitter to minimize their exposure to what he referred to as the fake money system represented by fiat currencies. Similarly, Bitcoin supporter Lynn Alden delves into Bitcoin's role in addressing inflation and facilitating value transfer. According to her, Bitcoin remains the foremost credible method for transferring value over long distances without reliance on traditional credit systems. Additionally, Alden suggests that Bitcoin could potentially rectify distortions in the global economy resulting from the excessive monetization of assets like real estate and stocks. Daily Dose Crypto Challenge Win $1,000 of Bitcoin, simply, subscribe to our channel. Like this video, comment below how much you think Bitcoin price will be on January 1st, 2024. Winner will be announced January 1st, 2024, 6 p.m. GMT time. Good luck. Bitcoin kind of solves these last two problems, which is it's it's the first credible way to send value long distances without relying on credit. You know, all you're relying on is the ongoing functioning of a decentralized network. Um, you know, so you're all you're all you're relying on is they're not being a 51% attack to reverse your transaction, which is different than credit. Um, so you're sending a, a largely irreversible bare asset to someone uh, at roughly the speed of light, especially if you're using something like the Lightning Network. But even if you're using the base layer, it's you know half an hour for a reasonably settled transaction. Um, and also, you have infinite value density. So, for example, unlike uh, an airport, like a, with an airport with cash or gold, you know, with Bitcoin, you could memorize twelve words and bring a billion dollars through an airport if you had it. Right? There's just infinite, infinite um, value density that can go so in beautiful. and out of countries. It's so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It just, yeah. yeah, it just bra- it breaks that whole thing wide open. And then, secondly, if I want to pay a videographer in Egypt, he can send me a QR code or a string of numbers, and I can pay him in whatever he wants. It could be Bitcoin. It could be dollar stable coins. You know, whatever he wants with, with reasonable privacy. Yeah. Yeah. With reasonable privacy. And it depends. And there's ways to improve that over time. But, you know, he can get some degree of, of just direct to him that goes around his local banking system. Um, the same thing is true. Like if there's a, a Norwegian graph designer and she, she charges whatever she wants, she's OK, I want stable coins. I want bitcoins. Uh, and instead of going through like their local official exchange rate. Um, it can go at the the real kind of the street exchange rate. Like it can, it can get directly to her, and then she can either, in some cases, depending on where she is, just spend that directly. She could spend with Bitcoin or spend with stable coins. Or if she does convert to the local currency, she's now basically converting on the the street rate, which is better for her to to get back into the local currency. And so these kind of 160 different currency bubbles are every one of them has their gates down now. They're all starting to get cracked open. And of course, this takes time because only in the past five years has any of this been liquid, right? So I mean, stable coins were tiny until this last cycle. Bitcoin was fairly small to the last like two cycles. And until it gets kind of bigger, less volatile, just more liquid overall, more awareness, more comfort with how it works, you know, it's kind of limited at the current time. But the more Bitcoin communities pop up, the more people use stable coins, whatever whatever's working for them, whatever the market forces kind of end up wanting. There's there's pros and cons to both, obviously. Um, that just starts cracking this like artificial framework we've had for the past you know century and a half, really. I don't think that the market understands that it how big that can be yet. Like that's it can change macro, it can change money. It has huge implications, 
as long as just a couple things are true, as long as the Bitcoin network remains decentralized, secure, uh, and as long as it, it, its overall adoption and liquidity keeps improving because it is solving a problem. Um, and if, as, if that happens, then that, I think, just increasingly chips away at these currency bubbles we have. Robert Kiyosaki emphasized his ongoing strategy of shifting fiat assets into Bitcoin and precious metals, citing a lack of concern from leaders and attributing their actions to perpetuating war and poverty. On October 20th, Kiyosaki made a prediction that the gold price would soon hit $2,100, anticipating a further rally to $3,700 in the near future. In August 2023, he also forecasted Bitcoin reaching $100,000, taking into account geopolitical issues threatening global prosperity. Discussing Bitcoin's potential, Lynn Alden acknowledges that certain conditions must be met for it to realize its full capabilities, including maintaining decentralization and ensuring the security of the Bitcoin network. Additionally, she stresses the importance of increasing adoption and liquidity. Alden then outlines the various issues that Bitcoin addresses, positioning it as the optimal form of currency. Let's now listen to Alden's insights. The one that it solves, I think, most universally is the store value problem. Because wherever you go in the world, people are monetizing other things because they don't want to hold just money, uh, You know, especially in this kind of last 15 years of, of zero interest rate policy. Um, and you know, so they say, okay, well, I want to buy this really expensive real estate instead. I want to buy this really expensive equities instead. And of course, there are places for all of those. I mean, I, I have real estate and I have equities. Um, but it's like in Egypt, for example, people will buy an, an a, another home and it's just sitting there empty because they're like, well, I'm not going to like invest in the local stock exchange because it's not as reliable as like the U.S. market, and I'm not going to hold cash or bonds. So I guess it's it's real estate. You know, it's either real estate, gold coins, or physical cash dollars they got in the gray market. That's kind of their that's that's like their options, um, and and so it's just it's and in the United States we just shovel money into our four hundred one ks and just monetize the S and P five hundred, um, mm-hmm, yeah. and that that has some distortion effects on on business formation and things like that, um, and in, in some countries it's you know it's it's a lot of it's you get real estate bubbles because of that people say well you know I want to hold something that's outside of of this jurisdiction or I want to hold that and you kind of drive up certain prices beyond what they should be in a, in a healthier environment. And and those are just kind of, they, they distort things. Um, and then the other problem that Bitcoin solves for some people that those of us in the, in the West generally are less aware of is the payments issue. So for example, um, there's something like 40 currencies in Africa. Um, there's like 30 currencies in Latin America. Um, and it's it can be non-trivial, for example, to send money from Nigeria to Kenya, right? Or the or the cost to do so end up being just non non-trivial, uh, and that should be tr- it's 2023. That should be trivial. Um, and the interesting thing about things like Bitcoin is that it it just can bridge that gap. So like apps can work with each other as long as they have internet connection, and just have this kind of shared open source way of communicating with each other uh, in a way that's that's not really working for a lot of people right now. So, you know, those of us in the United States or Canada or Europe, we generally don't have that many payment frictions on a regular basis. Sometimes if we send an international wire, we'll, we'll be reminded how antiquated some of this is. But other than that, we generally don't go around every day thinking, you know, uh, like if only I had better payments. Um, only around the margins do we see it. But in a lot of countries, it's, it, it's non-trivial. And then especially when you do think of this global scale, when you think of global remittances, when you think of like apps and money systems being able to communicate with each other across borders. Um, I think all of that can get way better. And I think a really good analogy is email. So like every every like webmail client can talk to other webmail clients because they're using the same open source underlying protocols. They don't have to make like Yahoo and Gmail don't have to get together and make sure that their systems are compatible. They just have to make sure that their systems are compatible with the underlying open source. And so for, when you have open source, you know, Bitcoin base layer, Lightning, whatever other layers could exist, any entity that starts interfacing with those um, systems now starts interfacing with every other kind of environment, eco- money ecosystem in the world that is also tied into that system. And so, for example, Cash App uh, is, you know, it's got a very large you know, set of users, and by incorporating into the Bitcoin and Lightning network, they start connecting to you know other ecosystems around the world without even necessarily knowing it. Uh, now, there still can be frictions on that in terms of like 
KYC AML and, and kind of these artificial restrictions to start going on top of that. Um, but the point is, I think that basically having this, these open source layers that can, that can connect different monetary ecosystems together and, and bypass their artificial kind of firewalls, uh, I think changes a lot and mostly for the better. Bitcoin's hash rate reached an all-time high, signaling the network's strength and resilience just ahead of the highly anticipated halving event. The total hash rate, now at 491 EXA hashes per second, reflects the computing power used to secure the Bitcoin network. This surge not only makes it more challenging for potential attackers to gain control but also indicates a growing level of mining activity globally, with miners expanding operations and utilizing more machines to maximize profits. Hash computations, the process of turning data into fixed-length strings, play a crucial role in Bitcoin transactions by creating private keys. A higher hash rate contributes to increased network security as attackers would face substantial costs and energy consumption to match the existing hash rate. This aligns with the narrative that a higher hash rate requires more powerful mining hardware, potentially leading to increased costs for miners and higher energy consumption, a point that has previously drawn criticism. Looking ahead, the upcoming Bitcoin halving event, expected in April, is viewed as a bullish indicator for the market. Occurring every four years, this event reduces mining rewards, curbing Bitcoin inflation and historically driving increased demand for existing Bitcoin in the market. With Bitcoin's fixed supply of 21 million coins and over 19.5 million coins currently in circulation, the halving underscores the cryptocurrency scarcity and its potential impact on market dynamics. The call for investment in Bitcoin by Robert Kiyosaki and Lynn Alden prompts reflection on the significance of these developments. What are your thoughts on their perspectives? Share your opinions in the comments section below. For more Daily Dose Crypto News, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.